is the only American writer to win the Pulitzer Prize in both fiction and poetry, and America's first poet laureate, Robert Penn Warren, author of All the King's Men. Yet his short stories are little known, and they offer dark comic sketches of a nation at the crossroads. Welcome to the premiere of the second season of Trinity Rep Radio Theater, produced by Trinity Repertory Company and WRNI. Trinity Rep Radio Theater is a monthly exploration of dramatic literature featuring members of Trinity Rep's resident acting company. Today's program features three short stories by Robert Penn Warren. I'm your host, Bob C., and joining me is Kurt Columbus, Trinity Rep's artistic director. Good to see you again, Bob. And three members of Trinity's resident acting company, Janice Duclos, Fred Sullivan Jr., and Stephen Thorne. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Hi, Bob. Kurt, start out by telling us about Robert Penn Warren and his special relationship with Trinity Rep. Yeah, uh, Bob, it's interesting. I think most people know Robert Penn Warren only as the author of All the King's Men, which is a wonderful novel. And um, that novel was adapted for the stage by Trinity's first artistic director, Adrian Hall, in 1987. And we're about to open our new season with a new staging of that particular piece. So we thought it was a perfect moment to rediscover some of his short stories, um, which are as remarkable as any of his novels. Um, Penn Warren, just for our readers' background, was born and raised in rural Kentucky, but he was very well educated. He went to Vanderbilt and Yale and Oxford. Uh, He taught at Louisiana State University for many years during the 1930s, which is during the Huey Long governorship in Louisiana. And so obviously that gave rise to the long story that that is woven throughout All the King's Men. Um, But it's... uh, that All the King's Men experience was not Trinity's first experience with Penn Warren. And um, I'm Fred, I'm looking at you and, and wondering... <laughs> because I'm so old. <laughs> um, I know that Adrian Hall, the first artistic director of, of Trinity, was a huge fan of uh, Red Warren. He called him Red Warren. And uh, they became friends when he worked in 1968 on a stage adaptation of an epic poem by Penn Warren called a Brother to Dragons about a relative of Thomas Jefferson's murder of one of his slaves and it was a famous famous production in trinity history you can even rent it on netflix yeah it still (laughs) exists in video so i mean there's been a long association with this particular author and i think bob one of the reasons why is because his work is not uh, overtly political neither it is it about a particular point in time or a particular story but pen warren is this amazing, in my mind, uh, landscape painter. He gives us a portrait of a particular time and then lets Mm -hmm. us, as the viewers, judge it or um, step into it. And that's why it's so great to look at some of these short stories. The first story we're going to hear has one of the most intriguing titles I've ever heard. Absolutely. (laughs) It's called The Patented Gate and the Mean Hamburger. What could ever that mean? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're we're just going to do it for you. It's about what happens when a man of principle confronts hamburgers, orange pop, and modern times. Okay, let's hear Robert Penn Warren's The Patented Gate and the Mean Hamburger. You have seen him a thousand times. You have seen him standing on the street corner on Saturday afternoon in the little county seat towns. He wears blue jean pants or overalls, washed to a pale pastel blue like the color of the sky after a shower in spring. But because it is Saturday, he has on a wool coat, an old one, perhaps the coat left from the suit he got married in a long time back. If it is summer, he wears a straw hat with a wide brim, the straw fraying loose around the edge. If it is winter, he wears a felt hat, black once, but now weathered with streaks of dark gray and dull purple in the sunlight. With him may be standing two or three others like himself. They do not talk. The young men who will be like these men when they get to be 50 or 60 are down at the beer parlor carousing and laughing. But the men on the corner are long past all that. They are past many things. They have endured and will endure in their silence and wisdom. I had seen Jeff York a thousand times or near, standing like that on the street corner in town. He would be waiting for his wife and the three tow-headed children who were walking around the town, looking into store windows and at the people. After a while, they would come back to him, and then, wordlessly, he would lead them to the store where they always did their trading. He would go in first, then his wife a small woman with covert, sidewise, curious glances for the world, and behind her the towheads bunched together in a dazed, glory-struck way. 
In the store, when their turn came, Jeff York would move to the counter, accept the clerk's greeting, then bend down from his height to catch the whispered directions of his wife. He would straighten up and say, "'Give me a sack of flour, if you please.'" When the stuff had all been paid for with the grease-thick water-dollar bills which he took from an old leather coin purse with a metal catch to it, he would heave it all together into his arms and march out, his wife and two heads behind him, and his eyes fixed level over the heads of the crowd. He would put his stuff into his wagon and drive out to his place. For Jeff York had a place. That was what made him different from the other men on the street corner. They were croppers, but he, Jeff York, had a place. He stood with them because his father had stood with their fathers and his grandfathers with their grandfathers. Jeff York was one of those men, but he had broken the curse. It had taken him more than 30 years to do it, from the time when he was nothing but a big boy until he was 50. It had taken him from son to son, year in and year out, and all the sweat in his body. But those years had given him his place. 60 acres with a house and a barn. When he bought the place, it was not very good. The land was run down from years of neglect and abuse. But Jeff York put brush in the gullies to stop the wash and planted clover on the run-down fields. He mended the fences rod by rod. He patched the roof on the little house and propped up the porch, buying the lumber and shingles almost piece by piece and one by one as he could spare the sweat-bright quarters and half dollars out of his leather purse. Then he painted the house. He painted it white for he knew that that was the color you painted a house, sitting back from the road with its couple of maples beyond the clover field. Last he put up the gate. It was a patented gate, the kind you can ride up to and open by pulling on a rope without getting off your horse or out of your buggy or wagon. It had a high pair of posts, well braced and with a high crossbar between, and the bars for the opening mechanism extended on each side. It was painted white, too. Jeff was even prouder of the gate than he was of the place. Lewis Simmons, who lived next to Jeff's place, swore he had seen Jeff come out after dark on a mule and ride in and out of that gate back and forth just for the pleasure of pulling on the rope and making the mechanism work. The gate was the seal Jeff York had put on all the years of sweat. He could sit on his porch on a Sunday afternoon in summer before milking time and look down the rise to the white gate beyond the clover and know what he needed to know about all the years past. Meanwhile, Jeff York had married and had had the three two heads. His wife was 20 years or so younger than he, a small, dark woman who walked with her head bowed a little. From that humble and unprovoking posture, she stole sidewise glances at the world from eyes which were brown or black, you never could tell because you never remembered having looked her straight in the eye, and which was surprisingly bright in that secret flicker, like the eyes of a small, cunning bird which surprises you from the brush. When they came to town, she moved along the street with a child in her arms, or later with the three trailing behind her, and stole her looks at the world. She wore a calico dress, dun-colored, which hung loose to conceal whatever shape her thin body had. It was not that Jeff York was a hard man and kept his wife in clothes that were as bad as those worn by the poorest of the proper women. But Jeff still owed money. On the place, less than $200, which he had had to borrow to rebuild his barn after it was struck by lightning, he had, in fact, never been entirely out of debt. He had not been in deep, but he was not a man to forget the meaning of those years behind him. He was good enough to his family. Nobody ever said the contrary. But he was good to them in terms of all the years he had lived through. He did what he could afford. He bought the towheads a ten-cent bag of candy every Saturday for them to suck on during the ride home in the wagon. And the last thing every Saturday... Jeff York always took the lot of them over to Slick Harden's Do Drop In Diner to get hamburgers and orange pop. The towheads were crazy about hamburgers. And so was his wife, for that matter. You could tell it, even if she didn't say anything, for she would lift her bowed forward head a little, and her face would brighten, and she would run her tongue out to wet her lips just as the plate with the hamburger would be set on the counter before Slick had a good business. He had been a fighter over in Nashville and had got his name in the papers a few times. He was born here, however, and he started the dog wagon, the first one ever in town. When he said something that he thought was smart, he would roll his eyes around to see who was laughing. 
and then he'd wink. He had done very well with his business, for despite the fact that he had picked up city ways and a lot of city talk, he still remembered enough to deal with the country people, and they were the ones who brought the dimes in. Slick Harden was perhaps trying to be smart when he said what he did to Mrs. York. Perhaps he had forgotten, just for that moment, that people like Jeff York and his wife didn't like to be kidded, at least not in that way. He said what he did, and then grinned and rolled his eyes around to see if some of the other people present were thinking it was funny. Mrs. York was sitting on a stool in front of the counter, flanked on one side by Jeff York and on the other by the three towheads. She had just sat down to wait for the hamburger, there were several orders in ahead of the York order, and had been watching in her sidewise fashion every move of Slick Harden's hands as he patted the pink meat onto the hot slab and wiped the split buns over the greasy iron to make them ready to receive it. She always watched him like that. That day, Slick set the hamburger down in front of Mrs. York and said, Anybody likes hamburger much as you, Mrs. York, ought to get him a hamburger stamp. Miss York flushed up and didn't say anything, staring at her plate. Slick rolled his eyes to see how it was going over, and somebody down the counter snickered. Slick looked back at the Yorks, and if he had not been so encouraged by the snicker, he might, when he saw Jeff York's face, have hesitated before going on with his kidding. People like Jeff York are touches. And they are especially touches about the women folks, and you do not make jokes with or about their women folks unless it is perfectly plain that the joke is a very special kind of friendly joke. The snicker down the counter had to find the joke is not entirely friendly. Jeff was looking at Slick, and something was growing slowly in his face. But Slick did not notice. The snicker had encouraged him. Yeah, if I like them hamburgers as much as you, I'd buy me a hamburger stand. Fact, I'm selling this one. You want to buy it? There was another snicker, louder, and Jeff York, whose hamburger had been about halfway to his mouth for another bite, laid it down deliberately on his plate. But whatever might have happened at that moment did not happen. It did not happen because Ms. York lifted her flushed face, looked straight at Slick Harden, and swallowed hard to get down a piece of the hamburger or to master her nerve. You selling this place? Nobody had expected her to say anything. The chances were she had never said a word in that diner in the couple hundred times she had been in it. They had come in, and Jeff York had said, Give me five hamburgers, if you please, and make them well done, and five bottles of orange pop. Then, after the eating was over, he had always laid down 75 cents on the counter and walked out, his wife and kids following without a word. But now she spoke up and asked the question in that strained, artificial voice, and everybody, including her husband, looked at her with surprise. As soon as he could take it in, Slick Harden replied, Yeah, I'm selling it. She swallowed hard again, but this time it could not have been hamburger. What you asking for it? $1,450. She looked back at him while the blood ebbed from her face. She returned her gaze to the hamburger on her plate. It's a lot of money. Lady, I got that much money tied up here. This lot cost me more than... He suddenly realized that she didn't have a dime in the world and couldn't buy his diner, and that he was making a fool of himself, defending his price. He stopped abruptly, shrugged his shoulders, and then swung his wide gaze down the counter to pick out someone to wink to. But before he got the wink off, Jeff York had said, Mr. Harden. Yeah? She didn't mean no harm. She didn't mean to be messing in your business. Ain't no skin off my nose. Ain't no secret I'm selling out. My price ain't no secret, neither. Miss York bowed her head over her plate. She was chewing a mouthful of her hamburger with a slow, abstracted motion of her jaw, and you knew that it was flavorless on her tongue. Slick said later to the men who came into the diner, That woman's crazy. I'm selling me this place. I'm tired of slinging hash to them hicks. But that woman, she ain't got a dime. She ain't gonna buy it. But she did. It was almost the end of the next week before it happened. What had been going on inside the White House out on Jeff York's place, nobody knew or was to know. 
Perhaps she just starved him out, just not doing the cooking or burning everything. Perhaps she just quit attending to the children properly, and he had to come back tired from work and take care of them. Perhaps she just lay in bed at night and talked and talked to him, asking him to buy it, nagging him all night long, while he would fall asleep and then wake up with a start to hear her voice still going on. Or perhaps she just turned her face away from him and wouldn't let him touch her. He was a lot older than she, and she was probably the only woman he had ever had, so she had him there. But perhaps she used none of these methods. She was a small, dark, cunning woman, and she could have thought up ways of her own, no doubt. Whatever she thought up, it worked. On Friday morning, Jeff York went to the bank. He wanted to mortgage his place, he told Todd Sullivan, the president. He wanted $1,450. Todd Sullivan would not let him have it. He already owed the bank $160, and the best he could get on a mortgage was $1,100. That was in 1935. Half the land of the country was mortgaged anyway. Jeff York sat in the chair by Todd Sullivan's desk and didn't say anything. $1,100 would not do him any good. Take off the 160 he owed, and it wouldn't be a little over $900 clear to him. He sat there quietly for a minute, apparently turning that fact over in his head. Then Todd Sullivan asked him, how much you say you need? Jeff York told him. Well, what do you want it for? He told him that. Well, I tell you, that diner ought to be a good proposition, all right. I don't want to stand in your way if you want to come to town and better yourself. The bank can't lend you the money, not on that piece of property. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy your place. I could use me a little place of my own for my horses. I'll give you 1700 for it cash. Jeff York did not say anything to that. He looked slow at Todd Sullivan as though he did not understand. Seventeen hundred. That's a good figure for these times. Jeff was not looking at him now. He was looking out the window across the alleyway. Todd Sullivan's office was in the back of the bank. The banker, telling about it later when the doings of Jeff York had become a moment, a matter of interest, said, I thought he hadn't even heard me. He looked like he was half asleep or something. I coughed to sort of wake him up. You know the way you do. You can't rush those people, you know. But I couldn't sit there all day. I had offered him a fair price. Jeff York took it. He took the $1,700 and bought the dog wagon with it and rented a little house on the edge of town and moved in with his wife and the towheads. The first day after they got settled, Jeff York and his wife went over to the diner to get instructions from Slick about running the place. He showed Ms. York all about how to work the coffee machine and the stove and how to make up the sandwiches and how to clean up the place after herself. She fried up hamburgers for all of them for practice, and they ate the hamburgers while a couple of hangers-on watched them. With money in his pocket, Slick was heading out to Nashville on the 7 o'clock train and was feeling expansive. He wiped the last crumbs and mustard off his lips and got his valise from behind the door. Lady, you sure fling a mean hamburger. Lady, get in there and pitch. I hope you make a million hamburgers. That was the last anybody in town ever saw of Slick Harden. The next day, Jeff York worked all day down at the diner. He was scrubbing up the place inside and cleaning up the trash which had accumulated behind it. Then he gave the place a good coat of paint outside. White paint. That took him two days. He had that place looking spick and span. Then on the fifth day after they got settled, it was Sunday, he took a walk in the country. It was along toward sundown, not late, for by October the days are shortening up. He walked out the Curtisville Pike and out the cutoff leading to his farm. It was still light enough for the Bowdens, who have a filling station at the corner, to see him plain when he passed. The next time anybody saw him was on Monday morning, about six o'clock. A man taking milk into town saw him. He was hanging from the main crossbar of the white patented gate. He had jumped off the gate. But he had propped the thing open so there wouldn't be any chance of clambering back up on it if his neck didn't break when he jumped, and he should happen to change his mind. But that was an unnecessary precaution as it developed. Miss York was much cut up by her husband's death. People were sympathetic and helpful, and out of a mixture of sympathy and curiosity, she got a good start in trade at the diner. And the trade kept right on. She got so she didn't hang her head and look sidewise at you and the world. She would look straight at you. 
She wasn't a bad-looking woman, as a matter of fact, once she caught on how to fix herself up a little. The railroad men and the pool hall gang liked to hang out there and kid with her. Also, they said, she flung a mean hamburger. The Patented Gate and the Mean Hamburger by Robert Penn Warren. We heard it read by Janice Duclos, Fred Sullivan Jr., and Stephen Thorne. This is Trinity Rep Radio Theater. What happened to Jeff York? <laughs> and it's interesting how Robert Penn Warren, uh, he keeps asking the same question. What happened in that house? What was said between the two of them? Uh, we really don't know what Jeff York was thinking, or what do you think he was thinking? Stephen? Stephen? Wow, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, when, when we were first reading over this, I there was, uh, I think some of us had a reaction that, that it almost seemed like they hadn't even said anything at all, that this whole thing had, had perhaps even happened without them exchanging a word. And, and it, that, to me, even made it more shocking to think that this guy who had worked for 50 years of his life to get this, this place had, per, perhaps might be willing to, <laughs> for whatever reason, to just turn it all over and then realize, of course, he can't, he can't live without it. Um, but yeah, that is the question. What what happened between them? What's that thing? Yeah, I, I, uh, wonder, Janice. I wonder too. Um, listen, listening to it this time through, I don't know much about um, what the status would be, what uh, how how status works in in that kind of a little town. But I wonder if the fact that she brought all this up in front of her husband, Hmm. if it was a matter of pride Hmm. that maybe he would have to carry through and show that he could buy this diner and that that was part of it was the public embarrassment of having brought up the price and whether or not they were capable of buying such a thing. Do you think when he went in to talk to the banker, he knew that ultimately he would have to give up his home? Well, I think he was hoping he would have his cake and eat it, too, mm. that maybe it was possible that he mm. would be able to mortgage, mortgage the it. farm, and he would, his wife would have the diner, which she obviously wanted very badly, and that he would be able to keep his farm, too. It's funny. I, this is the first time in listening to this story read through that I thought um, uh, that Mrs. York had an agenda all along. <laughs> you know, you start, it's, a, a part of it is Penn Warren's description where he, he has her with her head bowed. I mean, she looks, she's, she's like a little bird, you know, right. there's cunning, a, yeah, dark and cunning and yeah. sidewise <laughs> glances at the right. world. I mean, you, you start to understand that she actually has a plan and she didn't marry Jeff York for no good reason at all. You know what I mean? It's really the, yeah. the psychology of those, uh, quote unquote, those people. I mean, and Slick Harden calls them those people uh, is is part of what he's unpacking here. And also, Jeff York does this to me. It struck me as almost ceremonial when he paints the restaurant white. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And then he's, you know, he's takes himself like out of the picture movie. completely. But I think Robert Penn Warren, it, it, the speculation about what people are thinking and their motivation is what's yeah. so fascinating. And he's really saying to us, we never really do know, do we? Right. <laughs> well, and you, you have this fabulous character, the, the Slick Harden character, <laughs> yeah. who right. is... Who's, Slick. <laughs> who, well, right. I mean, his name is Slick Harden, but um, uh, whose motivations seem to be on the surface. But there's some, there's even something going on with that guy because he just disappears from town, right? You know. Right. The, there's something there. I think we can all agree that when we hear it and read it again and again, we get more and more from this story. Absolutely. And like most of the, the stories. The thing that I loved most, in All the King's Men, there's a passage about how life is like a spider web and all of our actions uh, cause a ripple through the spider web and either awake fate of the spider with his dripping fangs <laughs> or have an effect on someone else. And so... It seems like the cost of our actions, the consequences of our actions. You talked about Penn Warren as a landscape. He also mm-hmm. does these brilliant communities where everybody is connected and exactly. the rules are just gorgeous and the texture is great. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear the next story. So yeah. tell us about that, Kurt. This one is entitled The Confession of Brother Grimes. Right. And it is a different view of uh, the same theme, the theme of living by one's principles. But in this case, the principle is, quote, the punishment fits the crime, and we'll hear how that works. 
It may depend on what you mean by crime. They say the Lord fits the punishment to the crime. And the Lord's ideas on crime and my ideas might not be exactly the same. That's just one way of looking at it, you might say, for the sake of argument. And then there's another question. Who is on the receiving end of the punishment and who did the crime he is getting punished for? The night Archer Munn tried to drive a new Ford Coupe through the back end of a parked truck that didn't have any lights on out on that new concrete road toward Morgansville, the punishment was distributed right liberal. Archie's wife, he'd been married to six months, her name being Sue Grimes before she married him, was the most sensational performer when it come to taking punishment. That truck had a pole sticking out behind, and it just went through that Ford, including Sue Grimes, like the toothpick through a club sandwich. But Sue didn't hog all the punishment, there being plenty to spare. They found Archie, alive, bunched up in a field with so many bones sticking out of him, they said he looked like a mad porcupine. Mrs. Grimes never got over the shock when she heard the news and died pretty soon. Her heart never haven't been any good to speak of anyway, and you might add her liver and lights for that matter, considering the time she always spent in bed complaining. Then there was Brother Grimes, as good and kind a man as you ever hoped to see, and a preacher to boot, brought down in sorrow and white hair to a lonely old age, all by consequence. The punishment was pretty general, not to mention a Negro on top of the truck who got thrown off and skidded on the place where some people claimed his face had been, but you couldn't tell it. If they made a death mask of it like they did a Napoleon, it would have looked like a statue of a fallen omelet. The Lord's ways are mysterious. That's what Brother Grimes said in his sermon as soon as he was able to preach, which was after the accident, but before his wife gradually died. But they move in perfect justice. The church was packed to the gunnels, for people wanted to hear what he would say after his tribulation, and they were sorry for him, too. He always was a fine-looking man, even if he was about 65, a big, strong fellow with flashing eyes and a mop of long black hair on his head, not a gray hair in it. He had a wonderful voice. He had such a fine voice, they said he could bring tears to your eyes when he gave thanks in front of a platter with three fried chickens on it. Up in the pulpit, he would shake his big, fine head like a lion with all that black mane of hair, and that voice would come rolling out. The Lord's ways move in perfect justice. This was one of his favorite sayings, but it raised the question. Not that there was much question about Archie Munn not deserving what he got, for there wasn't any meanness this side of murder and robbery he hadn't been up to. He was a liquor head, and no woman who prized her reputation would be caught out with him, and no man who wanted to stay out of the hospital would ride in a car with him on account of where he drove. Every time they built a new stretch of concrete road anywhere in ten counties, Archie had to go over and christen it like they christen a ship. Only he wouldn't bust a bottle of champagne on that concrete, not being a hand to waste liquor. He'd just go bust up a car and maybe some bones, his or somebody else's. That was the fellow Sue Grimes married. Marrying him must have been her crime. If you figure you gotta figure out her crime that close. It's the only one ever anybody ever figured out for her, for nobody even lifted a tongue against her in any other respect. That being her crime and her a young girl to boot. The punishment seemed to fit with considerable despair around the edges. There was something to hang over the edges and fit in the punishment to the crime for Mrs. Grimes, too, who was, according to all reports, a good but complaining woman, and some despair in fitting the punishment to the crime of Brother Grimes, even after he figured it out and confessed it before God and man. There might have been a little despair in fitting the punishment to the crime of the Negro, too, but you couldn't tell because nobody knew anything about what you might call the Negro's private life. In the end, Brother Grimes figured out his own crime to his own satisfaction. It just goes to prove what I always say. The Lord's ways move in perfect justice and the punishments fit the crime. He kept on saying it almost every Sunday in some connection, even if it looked like he dragged it in by the tail. The Lord's ways move in perfect justice. Then Mrs. Grimes died, or died may be too strong a word for what she did, since it didn't seem she had even been alive proper during the ten years since they come to town. Brother Grimes preached the funeral himself, even if he looked like he was ready to fall down by the grave. He looked so bad. 
It was the last hot weather before the summer breaks and a drought, too, and the sweat ran down his face. His face was white as paper, and his long black hair was plastered to his head with sweat. Oh, Lord, we believe in thy justice. He went home that afternoon, walking by himself all the way from the bare in the ground in the hot sun. He shut himself up and wouldn't see anybody. He fired his cook. The first day or two, some women in the church tried to get in. Go away. I'm going to wrestle with the angel by myself. Some said he was losing his mind. Nobody laid eyes on him. Then, one Saturday, he telephoned Deacon Broadbent he was going to preach the next day. When he came in to do the preaching, his hair was white as snow. Well, soon after, Brother Grimes invited Archie Munn to come and live with him. They would sit out on the front porch of an evening, Archie with the crutch he still had to use, and talk. Nobody knows what they talked about, but everybody knew Archie was a reformed character because he had promised his wife to reform just before he killed her in that Ford car. Brother Grimes said, It all happened just to save Archie's soul and to bring him to his senses. Now I could lean on Archie. My poor wife and daughter would be glad to have it that way. Either he had forgotten a Negro or he wasn't so sure how the Negro would feel about it. Anybody could have guessed what would happen. Archie threw that crutch away, got hold of some whiskey in a car, and went out and killed two white men and a horse in broad daylight. The horse was hitched to a buggy, and the men were in the buggy, that is, up to the time Archie hit. Then the buggy and the man and the horse were all separated from each other. Archie was lucky that time not being hurt a bit. They put him in a penitentiary. No, you could tell it was about the last straw for Brother Grimes. But he didn't say a word till the Sunday after Archie got sentenced. Then he spoke from the pulpit. The punishment was fitted to the crime. I'm not talking about the punishment of that poor misguided boy. I'm talking about my own punishment, for I feel responsible. I have lived a lie, and the Lord moves in his great justice. That my poor wife was taken and I ceased to live a lie. My crime was pride. Pride and sinful vanity. And pride was the crime the angels fell out of heaven for. And now he was going to confess before God and man. I have used black hair dye for 20 years. (laughs) (laughs) That was the confession of Brother Grimes by Robert Ben Warren with Janice Duclos and Fred Sullivan Jr. on this third Trinity Rep Radio Theater. Uh, well, <laughs> from the sublime to the ridiculous. another <laughs> another surprise ending by Mr. Warren. Consequences to our actions. Uh, yeah, I'd like I'd you like do to, want uh, the music to come the dun 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 <laughs> something like that to end it. But... Da, 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 da. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> well, Janice, you, uh, the wonderful narrator in this story, oh, and we you. should say something about Robert Penn Warren's narrators because they're so wonderful. And well, we can just, just hearing you, we know who you are. We've all met you somewhere along the line <laughs> at some church social or something. <laughs> Well, you know, the narrator is always the biggest challenge in all of these radio theater pieces that we do. And lucky for me, this is such a great character with such a strong point of view. And she's she's really got an issue that she is grappling with while she is telling the story, which makes it very present, that she wants to know... If the Lord fits the punishment to the crime, then how does that apply in these particular cases? Right. You know, and that's what drives the storytelling, and that what that's what makes made this particular piece a lot easier for me and so much fun because you know it's such a rich, gossipy character. <laughs> well, it's uh, and she doesn't come to any conclusions. That's it's it's uniquely Penn Warren in that way, right? It, it, um, or any, I, I'm suddenly realizing it's like Chekhov too, isn't it? Where, where, yeah. where you you don't get the conclusion, you get the question. And because the question is out there and unanswered, then it sits within you. So that's why, um, Bob, I think all of these narrators become so vivid because they're not resolved. I think hearing it aloud, too, really makes you laugh out loud. Indeed. I mean, I, in the being in the room with Janice, 
we were all kind of rolling around on the floor. <laughs> because, and I think if I had I just read it in front of the fire, I wouldn't have mm-hmm. quite that same reaction. Right. I mean, but hearing it interpreted and hearing it really li- is so rich and wonderful. Yeah, this character's that. not in the story. It's the, literally in the rhythm. From the point of view. Of the point of yeah. view, as opposed to anything that he it, he doesn't describe her. In fact, he doesn't even tell us it's a her. You no, just you no. can hear it in the way that the words are shaped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it, th- after all the murder and mayhem, <laughs> we have the minister who is uh, concerned about his his a- vanity appearance. Right, his appearance. <laughs> the hair just dye. A, a, just a great turn. It's my he's fault. He's trying so hard to justify what he's preaching to his flock. Right. You know, they're all looking at him like. Does this fit the crime? Does it yeah. fit the crime? <laughs> and what what was the crime? <laughs> oh, I get it. It's and then, my fault. Yeah, the two men and the cart and the horse and it's and then now you you really got a question there, brother. Half Christ. the town is dead. It yeah. must be my fault. Yeah. The hair dye. <laughs> well, that leads us to our last story, right. which is entitled A Christian Education. A Christian Education, which is a boyhood memory. Um and it, it's a story about what happens when you turn the other cheek. We'll hear a Christian education by Robert Penn Warren. Mr. Jim Nab, who was a successful farmer and highly respected in our section, had about 350 acres of first-rate land, a couple of big red barns, a big house painted red with the same kind of paint used on the barns, a big fat wife, and a boy who wasn't right bright. He was a good man, everybody used to say, and from all reports, I reckon he was. He was superintendent of the Sunday school at the Methodist Church in town, and I can recollect the time when I was a boy and used to go to church, and recollect him there every Sunday up in front leading the singing or making the announcements. He didn't have either the bullying kind of voice or the tearful kind of voice like most people have who get up and talk a lot in public to show off, especially in church. But when he talked or made his announcements, everybody listened close, even if his voice wasn't very strong, because he was so well-respected in the community. Mr. Nab never smiled, that is to speak of, but he always had a sort of sad look on his face. He didn't have a sour look, just sad and resigned, like he was carrying his cross, as the saying goes. Looking back now, I reckon he had that sad look on account of his boy not being very bright which must be enough to make a man sad, especially when you've got a good piece of land and a house like his and money in the bank, but nobody to leave it all to when you pass on to the better world. I guess he wanted another child mighty bad, somebody who could take up where he left off, so to speak, and protect the one who wasn't very bright. I can remember the ladies talking about how Mrs. Nab just couldn't get in a family way no matter what she tried. And her health wasn't too good anyway, like it frequently isn't with those big fat women who ail all the time and are inclined to cry if you look at them. Anyway, it took Mr. Nab 11 more years before he got any results and there was another baby, which was a boy, too. Mrs. Nab told the ladies it was just an answer to prayer. But when the second baby came, Mr. Nab didn't lose that sad look like you might think, even if now he did have what he'd been praying for for such a long time. His face had probably just grown that way by that time. Or maybe he wasn't sure the new baby would turn out to be right bright either, for you can't tell when they're little, and he didn't want to be counting his chickens before they hatched. And by the time the new one, Alec Nab, had got any size on him, and you could tell he had good sense, something else happened to make Mr. Nab look sad again. Everybody always felt sorry for Mr. Nab because he was a good man and tried to practice what he preached. A Christian education, he said, was the greatest thing in the world. And he tried to give his boy, the one who wasn't right bright, a good raisin. And it must be pretty hard to try to give a nitwit a good Christian education when they look at you that way and are liable to slobber. When they look at you that way, you must feel like you are just pouring something valuable down the drain. Silas Nab wasn't really an idiot. He just wasn't right bright. He was in the same Sunday school class I was in and got promoted when the time came, even if he couldn't answer questions. He could say the golden text sometimes, though, if he got a little prompting from his mother, who taught the class. When he got it all out, she used to look mighty pleased, and when he didn't and began to stare off at something else, the tears would start running down her cheeks. 
but he didn't get promoted in school after the first year or two, and after he was in the second grade for about three years, his father took him out of school, which is likely the only advantage of being a nitwit. But Silas learned one thing his people tried to teach him about being a good Christian. Mrs. Nab used to try to teach us boys in Sunday school about a soft answer turning away wrath and about turning the other cheek when somebody was mean to you and about the meek inheriting in the earth. Silas learned better than anybody about turning the other cheek. The boys used to pester him a little bit because they knew he wouldn't do anything about it or fight back. We never hit him or real mean to him. We just push him off the sidewalk out in front of the church when we're waiting for Sunday school to start. Or maybe rub our knucks in his head a little. <laughs> it don't hurt, but it sure makes you mad. <laughs> it's called the Dutch shampoo. <laughs> we used to get to Sunday school early because the only fun in going was to horse around outside before things got started. We stand around out there in front of wear good clothes. Some Somebody sneaks up to pull somebody else's tie. Or mess somebody's hair up. Then somebody sees the nabs come oh. driving up the street. Everybody straight now. <laughs> and look, look innocent. Mr. Nab would be sitting up in front holding the reins with Mrs. Nab by his side. Silas would be on the back seat leaning against the back and look behind at the dust they raised. Mrs. Nab would say good morning to all of us, calling us by our names, and then she would say to Silas, Silas, don't you want to play with the boys? Then she would leave him out there. The boys weren't really mean to Silas. They just pestered him. We'd push him off the sidewalk. We'd make him step in the deep dust, get his shoes full of dust. Or full of mud if it's muddy. <laughs> he would just say, don't, and come back up on the sidewalk. And somebody push him off again. <laughs> Even the little kids would push him. And I remember kids not more than four or five years old going up to push Silas when he was 10 or 12 and big for his age. <laughs> that was the funniest. And then somebody would say, Silas, why don't you lamb somebody for pushing you? I wouldn't let nobody push me like that. And maybe he would say, God says not to fight. That is, if he said anything. And somebody would say, Did God say that? You know, I didn't hear him say nothing, or maybe I just misunderstood him. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody ever got a rise out of Silas, except maybe to make him cry. If he cried, everybody would get afraid he would tell, and they'd wipe his nose and comfort him to make him stop. I used to get plain disgusted sometimes, and after I got any size on me, I never pushed him myself, because I got so I didn't approve of it somehow. But... <laughs> It was funny when the real little kids pushed him. But sometimes I used to wish Silas would knock hell out of somebody. There used to be a big Sunday school picnic every summer. All the women would fix up stuff to eat. Fried chicken and boiled ham and deviled eggs and beaten biscuits and lemon pie and chess pie and salt rising bread and tea and fruit jars. That summer, Silas was about 13 or 14 years old. Mr. Nab asked them to have the picnic out at his place, which, for a matter of fact, was a right good place for a picnic. There was a big pond, a sort of lake on his place, one with nice trees and some thickets you could hide in. And there was a good rowboat people used for fishing, though Mr. Nab himself didn't fish any. He just kept the boat there for people who liked to fish, which was one of the things that made Mr. Nab so highly respected in the community. We had the picnic out there under the trees. It was July and hot but it was cool in the shade with a nice breeze. After the ladies got everything fixed out nice on the tables, we all came up and stood around while Mr. Nab returned thanks for the blessings God had bestowed upon us. Then we got paper plates and paper napkins. And the ladies give us helpings of everything. We eat all we can hold. But there was always a lot left over because no lady likes to have people think she's stingy. Mr. Nab always suggested they ought to give what was left to the pole, which they did. We ate all we could, and then we lay around a little, letting it settle. But it don't take long for food to settle on a kid's stomach, so pretty soon we got to horsing around and playing games, playing high spy in the thickets and behind the trees. Then somebody, Joe Sykes, I believe it was, said to me, Let's go out in that boat. So some of us pushed the boat out and got in. Then Silas Nab came down and wanted to go too. Mrs. Nab didn't want him to go, but Mr. Nab came down and said it would do Silas good to go and asked us very politely, did we mind? It being Mr. Nab's boat, what could we say? I guess it's sure. All right. Yeah. We rode around out there in the pond some. 
but rowing around in a pond is never as much fun as you think it is before you start, unless you're fishing or something. And the sun was bearing down, too. The trouble was there just wasn't anything to do sitting out there in a boat in the sun. So the boys got to telling Silas dirty jokes like they did sometimes. Or teaching him dirty words. We ask him dirty questions, and no matter what he says, whether he says yes or no or what. It sure sounds, sounds funny. funny. It sounds <laughs> funny coming from a nitwit that way. Then the smallest boy in the boat, Ben Tupper, who was about nine years old maybe, got to pestering Silas. He was sitting behind Silas in the boat and... I pull a short hair on the back of Silas's neck a little or take his short tail out from behind. We told him to stop. It just makes him worse. All the time we were drifting around out there in the hot sun, little Ben Tupper wouldn't stop. So one of the bigger boys said... Ben, I'm going to slap your teeth down your throat if you don't stop. But after a minute, he kept right on. He would pull out Silas's shirt tail and say, Silas, what does God say? But Silas never said anything the whole time. I guess it was the sun bearing down and Silas being so crowded up with people in the boat that made him do it. And that boat was too full anyway. But Ben Tupper kept on pestering him. Silas, what does God say? All of a sudden, I noticed Silas had a little pocket knife in his hand, which his father didn't have any better sense than to give him one Christmas. So I yelled, Ben! But it didn't do any good. For just that second, Ben was jerking at the short hair on the back of Silas's neck again. And Silas swung round with that knife open to make a pass at Ben. One of the big boys up front near Silas made a grab for his arm and got stabbed in the hand. Damn you. And little Ben Tupper, just scared to death, jumped up and fell back to get out of the way. Mrs. Knapp, way back on the shore, must have seen something was up, because I can remember hearing her voice coming across the water. Silas! Silas! Maybe she caught the sunshine on that knife. But one of the other boys made a grab for Silas and maybe hit him accidentally, a something. Or maybe it was because little Ben started the boat to rocking so bad, but all of a sudden Silas hit the water and splashed everybody in the boat ringing wet. <gasps> you know how it is when somebody dives out of a boat. It sends the boat away a piece, too. Well, Silas fell out of the boat the same way, and by the time we stopped the boat rocking, we were more than 15 feet away. Silas came back up to the top of the water and began to yell and splash, and I saw that he couldn't swim. I was a pretty good swimmer, and I always figured I'd like to save somebody's life sometime and be a hero. But when I saw him go down again, I just didn't move a muscle. Even if I did hear a voice in my head, plain as day, saying, He's going to drown. One of the oars was lost and floating around near Silas, but he didn't see it or didn't have the sense enough to grab it. Get it, get grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. We paddled with the other oar and with our hands trying to get to him, but the boat was heavy and we didn't make it. We just sat there looking at the place a minute. He's drowned. <laughs> the tupper kid began to cry. We got the other oar and started back to shore. That was all we could do, and while we rode in, we could hear Mrs. Nab's voice screaming, Silas! Silas! We didn't look at her as we rode in. By the time we got there, she had fainted, and they had dragged her up from the shore piece, and the ladies were working on her. But there was Mr. Nab, and the other men standing there around him on the shore, watching us come. One of the men walked out in the water toward us. Boys, get out of that boat. We got out, and the men climbed in. Mr. Nab, too. Then one of the men said to me, Get your pants and shirt off. Get in here. And I did, though just for a minute I couldn't think what for. Then I knew I was going to have to dive for that body. That man knew I could swim and dive pretty good. So we rode back out to the place as near as we could tell. Mr. Nab, sitting on a seat in a boat, gone mighty white in the face and not saying anything and not crying. One of the men said, If we get him up right quick and maybe there's some breath in him. But Mr. Nab said, No, it's God's will. When we got out there, one of the men said, This the place? I said, I reckon so. All right. He didn't say for me to dive. He just said, all right. So I stood up, feeling the sun hit me on the back of my neck and between my shoulder blades and got ready to dive. I didn't look at Mr. Nab. The men held the oars in the water to steady the boat, and I dived. I was so nervous of 
something. I, I didn't get a good breath before I hit the water, and so I didn't get to bottom before I had to come up. One of the men helped me climb into the boat. None of them said a word, just sitting there in the sun. The next time I got bottom, I went down fast swimming, breaststroke down, and I felt my hand touch bottom, for it was so deep it was dark. The bottom of a pond is the softest place in the world and dark deep down, not water and not mud, just like velvet in the dark, only softer. And when my hand touched bottom that time, just for a split second, I thought how nice it would be to lie there. It was so soft and look up, trying to see where the light made the water green. Then I got scared and I swam for the top and popped out of the water with my ears roaring and the light sudden like an explosion. I kept on diving. I likely dived near 50 times, I guess, and I got bottom a lot of times. One time I touched the body on the face, and I made a grab for something to hold to, but I uh, missed, and I couldn't see in the dark. When I touched that face, I felt like screaming, but you can't scream under the water but once. When I missed, I came back on up. After a while, I got so tired out, I couldn't get in the boat hardly. The last time, they had to pull me in, and I couldn't move. I said I'd dive again in a minute, but Mr. Nab said, No. And thank you, son. They rode back in and took me out of the boat. Somebody had telephoned town, and some big boys and men had come on out to get the body. A young fella named Spooner dived down and got it. He got it on his third try, but that was just luck to get it so soon. I was sick at my stomach, and my head was about to pop open from diving so much. In a way, I was glad I didn't get the body, for if I had been the one to get it up, Mr. Nab might have thought I was good enough to save Silas when he fell in. It was mighty hard on Mr. and Mrs. Nab having a tragedy like that in a family, I reckon. In some ways, I reckon it is worse to have a nitwit die on your hands than somebody with good sense because you feel more responsible. But some people said it was a blessing in the long run, Silas being afflicted like he was, and the Nabs had Alec, who wasn't but about three years old then. Alec turned out to have good sense, all right, and they never tried to teach him about turning the other cheek like they did Silas. Somebody must have told him how the boys imposed on Silas because Silas never hit back. Alec turned out to be a terror. He wasn't very big, taken after his father, but he was a terror. He wouldn't take anything off nobody, and he always had a chip on his shoulder. The older he got, the worse he got that way. And he kept fast company, too. When he was about 22, he got in a row and shot a man with a thirty-eight. The man died. Alec is over in Nashville in the pen now, and I guess he'll be there a good long time. A Christian Education by Robert Penn Warren with Kurt Columbus, Janice Duclos, Fred Sullivan Jr., and Stephen Thorne. And this is Trinity Rep Radio Theater. And uh, plenty of irony in that story by Robert Penn Warren. Uh, Stephen, you had the bulk of the narration and the storytelling here. What what does the story say to you? Well, my gosh, uh, you know, there are things that you experience, you know, in your life that just just never leave you and you know you keep turning over and over in your mind details about the event and uh, in an effort to kind of relive it and also I think to kind of maybe re-examine you know what your part in it was I mean I think that's what this narrator goes through is that you know he he's saying we were just kids you know we didn't know better and yet clearly he feels an incredible sense of responsibility and guilt and also he's defensive about it and uh but actively kind of churning it over in his mind, as we all do with kind of, you know, traumatic events like this. Are you the one who receives the Christian education? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's a little the, the darkness to that, too. I think he's kind of rejected that a little, mm -hmm. you know, to some degree. I mean, maybe he sort of always did, cause, uh, but uh, clearly not living by that rule now. <laughs> yeah. Any of the uh, other of you like to comment? Kurt? Well, I just, I you know... <laughs> This you brought up the title, a Christian education, yeah. which is such a remarkable. Um, first of all, it's such a remarkable title for the story because it raises an expectation of what you're going to hear, and they give Silas a Christian education, and Silas dies, and they don't give Alec a Christian education, and Alec ends up in the penitentiary, and our narrator has stepped away from 
his Christian education. I mean, you can sense that in everything that he says. So what is what is Penn Warren telling us about this notion? I mean, it's just astonishing. He, of course, doesn't come to any conclusions, but he raises for us this really dense philosophical question. Yes, I mean, the, the narrator obviously rejects the idea of turning the other cheek and is saying how that's really the source of the problem, that he have, if he had only fought back, but he never chooses to blame these horrible boys who are picking on this kid who, who not only is, is just a child and has chosen not to, fought, to fight back, but, he, you know, he also doesn't have an IQ equal to the rest of the of mm-hmm. the kids that he's dealing but with. What is it about and they have the kids? no sympathy for him at all. Well, what, what is it about the kids, though, who kind of innocently, I mean, they say, you know, we, you know we, we have fun when we're doing it. I mean, they don't sound that malicious, even though what they're doing has terrible effects. But what is it that drives them to do this? Is it just human nature? Oh, boy. We that's tend a, to want to, we tend to, want to I mean, pick on people who are less capable than we are. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. How, <laughs> in, prep, <laughs> in preparing for this here, I'm going to admit something. Um, Fred kept saying, you're really a good bully. You're a good bully with you. And I said, well, that's because I was bullied so much as a child that I know who these kids are. And I, I think, of course, from an adult perspective, you, you start to say to yourself, well, they're doing that because, you know, they they get picked on at home or there's a, a you, you can trace where it starts. But in the moment, you're just getting picked on. And, and Silas, I think, is in that moment. And what Janice and Stephen are talking about in the acting of it, I think, is the justification you have for the, you know, ape-like acts you do to your fellow human <laughs> beings and how you kind of say, well, you know, we were just fooling around. But we it was just... so much fun. Yeah. So <laughs> we had funny. such a good time. Yeah. I, I, love, I love this story, and I, I find mm-hmm. it very, very moving. Janice and I were lucky enough to meet uh, Robert Penn Warren 20 years ago when we did All the King's Men and hear his voice. And when you hear that man's voice, and that's the reason why we decided to pronounce things in that kind of New York way, you know, the because that's how it how Red Warren sounds, and so we decided the color and the texture and the brightness of that voice needed to be heard in these stories. You can't separate one from the other, and that's one of the decisions we made in in acting of it. So and Fred, I mean, I, you're you're leading us back to to Red Warren. Um, uh, and I always feel a little bit hubristic by calling him that because I didn't really know him. But, but Red um, actually only published one collection of short stories. And, Bob, I, I want to lead our readers to uh, our listeners to read it, if possible. And it's called The Circus in the Attic and Other Stories. It was published in 1947. Um, and these three stories are, are all from that. You know, after he, he wrote several novels and uh, this collection of short stories, he devoted himself mostly to poetry um, from the 1950s on. And if I, if I might, just one short quote. Um, he said, short stories kill poems. Many times the germs of a short story could also be the germ of a poem, and I was wasting mine on short stories. I've only written three that I even like, and so I quit writing short stories. <laughs> well, I think they're pretty good, don't they're you? Great. I think they're <laughs> amazing. They're all from the 40s and, and from the uh, 50s through the 70s. He just focused on poetry. poetry. And really you get the feeling he really was there witnessing these events yeah. and characters. I mean, the, the detail and the specificity yeah. of his description. There's this kind of learned wisdom in all these stories. That I mean, wisdom with a great price, but it seems so kind of personal. Mm-hmm. And, and visceral that y- you feel like if they're not autobiographical, he was certainly in the vicinity. I mean, which is certainly uh, for all the king's men. I mean, is, is case in point, and that's and the I, detachment of history. There's some point of view going on here that is bigger than all of us, and o- right. over that yeah. community. And know, yet, right. through it is this theme of personal morality or mm-hmm. societal morality and where we fit in, and with all that complexity. But it, he, he never. He, it's never heavy because it's poetry, mm-hmm. right? He has a poet's light touch. And you hear um, it out loud and it's so humorous. It's so yeah. funny and yeah. beautiful. Ironic yeah. and funny. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, yeah. thanks to uh, all of you for introducing us to these wonderful short stories of Robert Penn Warren. You have been listening to Trinity Rep Radio Theater featuring Robert Penn Warren's stories The Confession of Brother Grimes, A Christian Education, and The Patented Gate and The Mean Hamburger. Copyright The Estate of Robert Penn Warren produced by permission of William Morris Agency LLC on behalf of the author. Trinity Rep Radio Theater is a production of WRNI and Trinity Repertory Company. Janice Duclos and Emily Atkinson, producers. Kurt 
Columbus executive producer and Joe O'Connor, general manager, and Jim Moses, technical director. Trinity Rep Radio Theater is made possible in part by generous support from the Rhode Island Foundation, a charitable community trust serving the people of Rhode Island. Thank you for joining us, and please tune in again next month. I'm Bob C. Thank you.